weeks ago, uh, Becky Watsack shared a picture with uh, Dewey Roth and I, and it was a picture of Dewey and I. We were up here on stage, and neither Dewey nor I had any recollection of this particular moment that we were on. I, had, I was like down here, and I had a microphone, and Dewey was up here like holding a weird piece of tin, fo- just being weird like Dewey is, you know, just, you know. And, and it just, I, I thought about it. It bothered me that I was like, why do I not remember what that is? And then it hit me that it was, um, and uh, Dave and Sherry Burkham are here this morning. Uh, nice to see you guys. And uh, Sherry, it was during the time when we were doing family table time, remember that? Uh, during, during the COVID uh, years when we were like just trying to figure out like what can we even do to get together and uh, wow, I realized, I wonder how many things I forgot during, you know, that my brain just was not working properly. Uh, but you maybe remember uh, how weird March 2020 was, do you remember? Um, it was just a very strange time. For our family, one of the things that was going on, Maddie happened to be, my daughter Maddie happened to be on a school trip, uh, spring break trip over to London and Paris. And while she was on that trip, uh, many of the international borders were clo- got closed. I mean, it were like, and our borders as well. The president said, hey, in a day or two, we're shutting it down. So Maddie and everyone on her trip, we were like, is she going to get stuck in Paris? Maddie's like, maybe, Uh, you know, (laughs) Um, which is good if if you can afford to be in Paris for a long time. That's great. Uh, But uh, the people who were organizing her trip did a great job and and got uh, all the students home, like, just in time. And now... I don't know if you, have you ever seen a documentary about uh, when, like, the first astronauts came back from outer space? I'm from the 1900s, okay? So um, I remember stuff like this. Like, uh, when the first astronauts got back from space, they would quarantine them, right? They, they were scared, like, what if they're bringing back some weird, you know, disease or virus or something from outer space? And so we, we picked up Maddie and her friends at the airport, and at that time, nobody was staying next door here at the Fellowship House, and so we put Maddie in quarantine over here at the Fellowship House for a couple weeks, and... If you ask Maddie about that time, she will tell you that that was like two of her favorite weeks of her whole life. Um, And a lot of introverts that I know, like, you know what an introvert's favorite thing is? When plans get canceled. That's, That's what introverts love. And March 2020, all the plans got canceled, right? And not only did the plans get canceled, it was like, and don't make any new plans, And introverts were secretly like, yay, you mean you're telling me I have to stay home and do nothing? It's so good. I remember having meetings with church leadership during March 2020, and we kind of could see that this was on the horizon, and we had some really serious uh, conversations about what if, what's going to happen if we can't meet together? And uh, one of the dynamics we were discussing is just, I mean, when you're part of church leadership, there are just financial realities that it takes to operate together as a church family. And one of the things we were concerned about is like, our staff, are we going to have, is giving going to just tank if if we can't meet together? And are we going to have to lay off staff or are we all going to have to agree to just take less? Church, giving didn't go down. It went up. It went up. And I remember just as a leadership just being so grateful and, and thankful to the Lord. Um, and it, it points to a reality that um, the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. And this morning we're going to think about what it means to be part of the body of Christ. And here the Apostle Paul is talking about how marriage, the marriage relationship is like the relationships that 
or the relationship that Jesus has with the church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. And Paul is pointing here to the mystery that when a husband and wife come together, they become one flesh, so that when a husband cares for his wife, he's caring for his own body because they're one flesh. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. So the first thing I want to point out to us this morning is that to be a part of the body of Christ is to be cared for and provided for by the head who is Jesus. Isn't that good news? <laughs> And church, I believe that Valley, we as a body of Christ and a church family, we have a testimony about how Jesus has cared for us and provided for us. Amen? I mean, even since I've been the lead pastor just for the last few years, I, I think about how Jesus has provided for us and brought the right people to join our staff team as certain people transition out. Jesus has the next person uh, ready uh, to step in and say, I'll take on that role. And not just our staff team, but our eldership and our deacons as well. It seems like there's always someone who's ready to step up, and Jesus is providing that for us. Um, as I look around the room this morning, Jesus has brought uh, incredible people into our church family uh, since that COVID time. And we're so grateful for those of you who have found Valley in the last few years and are making this your church family. It seems like anytime we put a missions fundraising goal in front of this congregation, you're all like, yep, no problem. Uh, we're going to send those mission teams out or we're going to meet that objective and help our mission uh, partners to, to do the work they need to do. And even sitting here in this building this morning, uh, meeting here in this place where, you know, we, we have a very small mortgage left on this building, so we're meeting here instead of in a different building where we had a mortgage that was 10 times the mortgage that we have now. Jesus has provided and cared for us as a church family. And I know that beyond our corporate testimony together, each one of us could give testimony to how Jesus has cared for us and provided for us. I wonder if as the disciples lived and walked and worked alongside Jesus, um, if they started to feel like, as long as we're with this guy, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> you know, it's like, are we ever going to go hungry if we're with Jesus? Don't think so. I mean, this is a guy who can turn a little bit of food into a lot of food. No problem. Is there ever going to be a storm that can overtake us? No, he's even got power over the Sea of Galilee and the weather and the wind and the waves. Is there, any, is there ever going to be an enemy that can threaten us? No, not as long as we are with Jesus. And on the other side of the resurrection, the Apostle Paul confidently proclaims that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Isn't that right, church? Amen. Jesus provides for his body and cares for his body. So I wonder if I could encourage us as we begin this morning to think about our identity as the body of Christ, to do so with gratitude that Jesus cares for us and provides for us so well. Can we just take a moment right now 
And I just want to encourage you to say thank you to Jesus for the ways he's providing for you, caring for you, and for our church family. Can we just take a moment and all turn our attention to Jesus right now? Jesus, we have experienced the truth of what Paul shares with the Ephesian church, that to be part of your body is to be cared for and provided for by you. We are so grateful that as our head, you nurture and care for us daily. Uh, Help us to maintain our connection with you so that we can receive these nourishing blessings that you pour into our lives in your name. Amen. So our identity is the body of Christ. And one of the ways that Jesus provides for the church is through his people. Through his people, enabled by his Holy Spirit to share the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit is giving to each one of us. And a couple things about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts always glorify God. And spiritual gifts always build up the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts bring glory to God, and they build up the body of Christ. And the only way spiritual gifts benefit the church is when the people who have those gifts serve according to them, use them, put them in to practice. So serving, giving time, giving effort, giving energy, giving resources to the church or through the church to others is how we put these spiritual gifts into practice. And church, there's no way to sugarcoat this, and I don't have to sugarcoat it because Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. If you're not serving, you're falling short of Jesus' expectations. If you're not serving, you're falling short of Jesus' expectation. I'll show you. In John 13, 14 through 17, you remember the scene in the upper room. What has Jesus just done for his disciples? He himself had gone over into the corner, got the towel and the basin, and he himself knelt down and washed every foot in that room. And Jesus says, so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. And I think that extends out not just to foot washing. That's a cultural practice that's long gone in our culture. But what's the spirit behind it? To serve one another. To not be filled with pride or importance, but to say, these people in this room, this is the body of Christ. It's bigger than that. But this is the body of Christ as we are put together here in Valley Christian Church. Truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If we're not serving, we're falling short of Jesus' expectation. You ever had any excuses about why you're not serving? I've heard a few. I've used a few. Let me tell you uh, what you can't use as an excuse. I'm looking at my youth row right here. You can't use the excuse that you're too young. I'm too young to serve. Uh Uh-uh. And I want you all, church, back here next week because our youth are going to serve us by leading our Sunday morning service. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And... And I know that our youth leaders value teaching our young people to adopt this mindset of serving. 
I know that they're going to Indiana this summer to serve for a whole week people in need, right? So I'm too young. What about I'm too old? Does that one work? What about, well, I kind of put in my time before, and I'm in a different season now. No, I reject that one. Well, maybe my contribution just isn't that important, you know. It's really the people up in front that are doing the important things, and I'm not an upfront kind of person, so maybe what I can bring, what I can do, maybe they can get along without that. We can't. We can't get along without any of the gifts that Jesus has given to his church. So I don't know what you think your excuse is, but I reject it. I reject it. We all have a way to bring glory to God and to strengthen the body of Christ. And I want to encourage you this morning as we adopt this identity as the body of Christ to say an important way that we function as the body is to serve according to our gifts. This is a great passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the church in Corinth was, let's be honest, getting a lot of stuff wrong, okay? They were having trouble exercising the spiritual gifts within the church in a way that wasn't being divisive and hurtful to the church. They were having trouble figuring out how to use their spiritual gifts together as a unified body. And so Paul writes to them and gives them some instructions. He says, now there are different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. So this metaphor of the body of Christ is meant to help us to see that there's diversity in the body, but there's also unity in that diversity, right? There are different gifts, different ministries, different activities, but they all have the same source. And so there's the unity behind all of these different ways of serving, okay? And Paul's going to enumerate some of the gifts, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list here. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it, it should blow our minds that, that when we see people serving in the church, really what's happening is that's God showing up through them. It's a manifestation. God making himself known and showing himself to us through the ways his people are serving according to the Spirit within them. Amazing. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. Another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpreting those tongues. One and the same Spirit is active in all these distributing to each person as he will. So why do we have the spiritual gifts that we have? Because the Spirit wants us to have them. Now you might say, I wish I could have that gift. Look at what that person can do. I wish I was more like that. Friends, that's kind of low-key slandering the Holy Spirit. to say, you know, I'm not really too big on what the Spirit gave me. I wish I could have what the Spirit gave you. Does the Holy Spirit make mistakes? I don't think so. I don't think so. The Holy Spirit has given to you the gift that the Holy Spirit wants you to have, and the Holy Spirit has an expectation that you're going to discover that gift, develop that gift, deploy that gift in serving others so that God can be glorified and the church can be built up. For just as the body is one 
and has many parts, so he's talking about a human body, and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, you'd expect Paul to say, so also is the church. What does he say? So also is Christ. That's how closely the church is connected with and associated with Jesus that Paul says, just like a human body has lots of different parts and yet it's one body, so also is Christ. We are a part of Jesus. Friends, don't ever forget the incredible thing that Jesus has done for us in laying down his life and providing justification for us and forgiveness for us. He draws us into union with himself so that we can have peace and reconciliation with God, so that we can have fellowship with him and fellowship with one another. So that's how closely we are associated with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free. We were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. You know me, I can't miss an opportunity to sneak some, he- uh, sneak some Ephesians in on you here. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's talking about the same kind of stuff with a different group of people. He says, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. So if we connect that Corinthians passage and this Ephesians passage, we see a couple of things. Every member of Christ's body has been given a spiritual gift by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. We're not going to dispute that. How do those spiritual gifts benefit any of us? Well, as each individual part does its work, that's how the body is built up and strengthened, and that's how it grows. So, raise your hand if you're responsible for the growth of Valley Christian Church. Say, I'm responsible. Okay. Okay. We're all responsible for the growth of this church, for the spiritual growth and health of this church. If, if more people are going to come in and join our fellowship, we're all responsible for that. I think right now, as church leaders, as we look out at Valley, we believe that Valley is a very healthy church congregation. I hope that you're experiencing Valley as a healthy church congregation. But I think there's a a few things that concern us, not many, but one I would point my finger toward if I was going to say what's concerning to us as church leaders. I would say I think there's an imbalance in who's serving Valley. And I think what we're noticing is that we have Uh, kind of a big group of people in the middle who are each doing one or two things, and that's really healthy. That's what we want. Then we have a small group of people who are doing too many things. Too many things. And then we have a small group of people who are doing no things. And that's not healthy either, okay? So, Ideally, you want everybody finding their place to serve. There are one or two main roles where they're like, this is how my giftedness fits. These are the things I bring to my church family, and we all serve according to those gifts. So what happens if this imbalance continues? What happens when a few people are doing too much? First of all, it doesn't reflect God's design or intention for his church. We've just read that What the Holy Spirit wants is to give spiritual gifts to the whole body and say, everybody participates, everybody serves according to this giftedness, and that's how the church grows together. So we're not reflecting God's design or intention if this imbalance continues. Some people are missing out on growing through serving. Serving is a great way to grow in your relationship with God. 
And we don't want anybody to miss out on that. Some people are missing out on the joy of serving. You all know if you've served, you know the joy that comes from allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you and and contributing and seeing people grow as a result of the ministry you're doing. And a real danger is the people who are doing too much can't keep doing too much for a long period of time. They're going to burn out because they're trying to carry too much. And we don't want some of our best servants to reach a point where they say, I can't do any of it anymore. I'm too tired. I'm spent. I just don't have the bandwidth anymore. And I've seen it happen. And it's tragic when it happens because people who are giving their best and have done so consistently over a number of years reach a point where they just say, "I'm I'm just too worn down to do it. Anymore, And it's not because they're using their spiritual gifts. It's because they're doing their ministry and the ministry of two or three other people. Don't make someone do their ministry and your ministry. It's not fair. And it doesn't reflect the design of Jesus for his church. And if you're not serving, if you're not contributing, what you're saying is, I expect someone else to do that because I'm not doing it. Friends, that's not healthy. And that's not how the body grows. So if, if you're here this morning and you're meant to feel some conviction about that, I hope you will. And I hope that the leaders of the, of the church can help you discover where it is you're supposed to be serving. Okay? If you're just like, I want to serve, I'm just in the dark about how to do that or where to do that, we, that's our job, okay, is to equip you, to get you connected to your ministry and to help you grow into that. That's our responsibility, and we want to take that seriously as well. So the final idea here for what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Um, Church, I think that we are going to be tested this year. I think we're going to be tested. Our culture is deeply divided, and in an election year, those deep divides, we just feel them more acutely, don't we? We, we watch the culture around us just fracture and segment even more. And I think Valley Unity feels very strong. As a matter of fact, our friend Sam Helgerson, who's coming in and teaching our Wednesday night adult class, said to me just this past Wednesday, he said, you guys have a real gift here of of community and unity among your people. And I thought, praise God. (laughs) It's such a blessing to have that unity. But church, I think we're going to be tested this year. We'll get to this in just a second. Um, I fear that we are losing our ability, as we read in the last Ephesians passage, to speak the truth in love with one another. Um, We're losing our ability to listen in love. We're losing our ability to disagree in love. You know... Listen, disciples, if you're a Christian and nobody can tell you hard things about yourself or (laughs) show you hard things in the Scripture, uh, you're just not going to grow very much. And you probably don't want to spend a lot of time with Jesus because he's kind of, uh, (laughs) he traffics in hard things, right? He tells it to us straight. So we have to have the ability to listen to things and process them and ask, is that true? Is that really the way it is? And and to look inward and to assess and discern things together. 
So what are you going to do when somebody in this church family posts something online that you think, wow, I don't think I agree with that? I think I see it quite differently, as a matter of fact, than the sentiment that this person is sharing online. Now, if we are going to be conformed to the pattern of this world, we would just say, well, I'm done with them. Dead to me. Our national leaders and a lot of the people we see in media are giving us an example that you can't disagree with someone unless they're also your enemy. That's the example we're getting, isn't it? Is that true? It's not a good example. But that is kind of the cultural norm. If we disagree, it means we're enemies. And it means I'm going to speak poorly of you personally. So if we want to conform to the world, that's how we would handle it. But if we're going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, we're going to say, this person who just posted something I disagree with, they're a member of the body of Christ, just like me. And I'm not going to reply with some snarky comment, you know, in their thread. I'm not going to send them an angry text message. I'm not going to unfriend or unfollow them. Maybe the next time I see them at church, I'm going to say, hey, I saw that thing that you posted on your feed the other day. Could we have coffee and just, I'd like to hear more about your perspective on that, because I think I see it differently than you, and maybe I could share some of how I'm processing that, and maybe we could help each other, you know, think through that issue a little more clearly. That seems like what members of the body of Christ would do. And here's what we're not going to do, church. We're not going to have important discourse on social media. Please. Say amen. Amen. <laughs> it, just, it just is not the place for it. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't lead us to good solutions, and it doesn't help preserve the unity of the body. It's, it's too impersonal, right? It's too impersonal. And it doesn't take seriously that we are members of one body together. And so the encouragement that the Apostle Paul gives us here, and we'll just close with this passage of Scripture, Paul says, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. So he's saying, you have been given an identity by God as the church. And what he's been talking about in chapters 2 and 3 of Ephesians is how God has taken Jews and Gentiles who really don't want to have anything to do with each other and said, I'm going to knit you together as one body in the church. That's going to be your new primary identity. So that's the calling you have received. And what's it going to take to preserve the unity in all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort. It takes effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Thank God we don't have to create it. He's done that, but it takes a lot of effort to maintain it and to keep it. And each one of us this year should say, I'm not going to break it. I am not going to undermine the unity of the Spirit. Which is given to us through the bond of peace. Why? There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Somebody should write a song. One God and Father <laughs> of all who is above all and through all. Right? Right? So, what holds us together is more important than what could drive us apart. Amen? Amen? The men who sat at Jesus' feet and who walked with him for many years did not agree on everything. They had deep personal differences. They had 
political differences, okay? Matthew works for the Roman government as a tax collector. You've got Simon the Zealot who's ready to take up arms in active opposition against Roman occupation and oppression. They didn't agree politically, but what they did agree on is following this guy is more important than any of that. We keep the unity of the Spirit because we are the body of Christ. Pray with me. Lord, forgive us when we fall short of your beautiful expectation for us as the body of Christ. Thank you that in him he continually is patient with us and he's purifying us and and he's going to present us as a bride without spot or blemish or wrinkle or any of that stuff. Jesus, thank you for continuing your work in us. But Help us also to obey what your word tells us to make an effort to do our best to serve according to the gifts you've given us and to keep the unity that you have provided us through your spirit. This is going to be an especially difficult year for us, God, in our nation. Help us by the testimony of how we love one another to show that we are your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.